Good evening. Goodbye Forever, Volume 2, Chapter 28, Part 3. How was I to make sense of Vadriana for Jumping Jack Flashman? So, didn't you do well at art school? Can't imagine you failing. Nah, mate, I laughed, deciding to join Jack in his penchant for Cockney. Got me a Randolph. Friggin' Randolph, eh? Good few knew it, didn't I? Didn't think you'd get an Attila or Desmond, let alone a Douglas. But couldn't you got a, get a good job with that? Maybe, but it's not what I want. Going to the Himalayas is... What would Jack understand? Going to the Himalayas is an adventure. I'll be staying in some fairly remote and ancient regions, places that are off the tourist map. So I suppose you'll write a book about your escapades? More than likely, I obfuscated. Sort of like Lawrence of Arabia. Sort of, Jack, I chuckled, but without the camels. Right, they have yaks there, don't they? Yaks and Dree. Yeah, Jack. The Dree are the females. Yeah, I think I married one of those. Still, not for that subject. I meant to ask you about your name change, Jack. Yeah, well, I didn't want anyone finding me through my name, did I? Wanted to cut off every connection. My parents disowned me, so what's bloody Hackman to me? John Sodding Hackman is no more. It's Jack Flashman now. Jumping Jack Flashman. Statutory declaration of name change. All it cost me was a lady. Got my own van now with JJ Flashman Esquire in that fierce emerald green lettering on dark blue. You know, the way you did it for Savage Cabbage. Always liked that. Had real class, that. Good name, Jack. Like it. It's got style with that double J. No connection with the Flashman character in Tom Brown's school, I suppose. You hit the proverbial nail right on the head, Mr Arbuthnot. I mean Cobham. So, how do you say that? Chugyum. Ch as in church, but ending with a G and yam as in sweet potato. But Cobham is fine with me. Right, churg yam, Jack tried. I smiled, nodded approval. So then, got the name from Flashman at the Charge. Playboy serialised it. He's the same bloke as Tom Brown's school days, but it's his later life as this adventuring soldier. As I listened to Jack gleefully describe the dissolute, dissipated, debauched, unscrupulous, pusillanimous anti-hero after whom he'd named himself, it all made sense to me. Jack was indeed a coward, but there's something disarming about a coward who freely admits his cowardice. Jack wasn't trying to pretend he was a bold, dreadnought kind of fellow who'd stand at the gates of hell and not back down. He'd run away from Cynthia. He was still on the run, even to the extent of having to hide under a table for 20 minutes. So I feel a little bit like Harry Flashman. Not that I'd do the dirty on a friend, but... I just don't have that bravery thing that people like you have. Wouldn't catch me going to India. Not even France with their pissars. Pissoirs, I interjected, and immediately wished I hadn't. I had not enjoyed that aspect of Claudette, and now here was I being just as much of a supercilious know-it-all. Right, pissoir. Never was any good at French. Nor was I, Jack, 
but every other freak at art school threw French around like you do Cockney. Then all my girlfriends attended grammar school, so I picked up a little Latin as well. It makes me sound more educated than I am. But with your flair for Cockney, you could pick it up as easily as I did. Good idea. I'll look into it. That could come in handy. But like I was saying, I just don't seem to have it in me to fight. Like when, when running away makes more sense. I knew Synth had turned into a bloody banshee brontosaurus about my leaving her. So I just planned it so I didn't have to face her. Didn't see why I should put myself through it. Why get beaten up if you can avoid it? And what good would it have done anyhow? Yeah, you don't have to say it. I suppose I'm a Frankie. I wasn't sure how to answer that at first, but started speaking anyway. You know, we're all Frankies in our own ways, Jack. And I guess we all have different kinds of cowardice. I mean, I wouldn't have whipped under the table when I saw Cynthia, but then that was pretty imaginative. But no, I guess I wouldn't have done that. Not because I'm brave, but because I'd have been too cowardly to let you see me do that, if you see what I mean. Then I launched into poetry. Then swear Lord Thomas Howard, for God I am no coward, but I cannot meet them here, for my ships are out of gear, and half my men are sick. I must fly, but follow quick. We are six ships of the line, can we fight with fifty-three? Then spake Sir Richard Grenville, I know you are no coward, you fly them for a moment to fight with them again. But I've ninety men and more who are lying sick ashore. I should count myself the coward if I left them, my Lord Howard, to those inquisition dogs and the devildoms of Spain. Sorry about the Tennyson. I still remember it from O-level English. I get carried away sometimes. I trailed off. Jack smiled. Yeah, apart from the bloody poetry, Jack laughed. I see what you mean. Good of you to see it that way. Well, Jack, I've never been the chest-beating kind, you know. I've never been one of those apes who need to make something out of their supposed bravery. I will stand my ground, but not to prove anything to anyone. It's just how I live. I stood my ground with my father because, well, because there was no way in hell I'd go on stage with a short back and sides. It would have taken far more bravery to go on stage with short hair than to have faced my father down. It would have been easier to live under a hedge or whatever than have short hair. Yeah, I can see that. And then, in the end, I had to face Cynthia down anyway. I chickened out in the past, mate, but then the bloody chicken came home to roast, didn't he? And he had the muscle of a limpic bloody ostrich. Quite, I grinned. That must have been foul. Jack laughed at the pun, and I continued. I mean, realistically, you didn't give in to her when she started breaking your boxes of stuff open, did you? And that must have taken courage. Yeah, see what you mean. True enough, mate. It'd make a film in full Technicolor. Bestseller novel. Yeah, I grinned. You could win the Pulitzer Prize with that story. I'd run the joke a second time before I realised it and had to explain that Pulitzer Prize was a pun on Pulitzer Prize. 
It worked well, however, and had Jack in tears of laughter. When he recovered, he said, going to use that one myself sometime. I hope you do. So I don't think you have to think of yourself as cowardly, do you? Making an attempt to bolster his confidence. It obviously wasn't a good idea to let your parents and Cynthia dragoon you into marriage and take a job under martial law with your father-in-law at the Midland, but maybe that's the last time you'll ever have to do something like that. We all have to learn from life and we can always learn. I'm always having to learn. I should have quit my last relationship a year before I did. Jack just stared at me and at first I thought I'd offended him by pontificating. But after a moment's reverie he said, Cheers mate. I think this Buddhism thing is turning you into a wise man or something. Wise guy, more like, I laughed. No, seriously, I remember that Ron used to call you the shrink of the outfit because you always seemed to know what made people tick. Have you always been into Buddhism? I mean, were you even into it back then? Since I was 14, Jack or even eight, if you go back to the first picture book of Tibet I ever saw, and interrupted. Jesus! Jack suddenly exclaimed. It's out of time. I'm meeting this really fierce bird at six. I need to get back to the flat and have a shower and change. Here's my card. Take a butcher's at that. Impressive, I grinned. So yeah, Drop me a card from Yeti Land, he said, standing up and donning his black velvet jacket. Like if they have cards up there in Shangri-La. Certainly, Jack. Have fun, I grinned. I hope the fierce bird will be a good friend to you. Jack turned and waved with a broad smile as he approached the door to the Nostril Cafe. And there I was. And there was Jack's card. There were two of them. J.J. Flashman, Esquire, Total Home Electrical Work, and Jumping Jack Flashman, Sound, Light and Beyond. Then the door closed and he was gone. It was almost as if he'd never been there. It was as if I had fallen asleep and dreamed the entire episode. I remembered the words of Dudjam Rimshe. With each life circumstance, whatever is enacted, stare directly into the enactment with all the senses. I sat for a while, simply sensing the ambience of the surroundings. How had all that happened? There was a moment in which I had no idea who I was. I found myself sitting there, simply aware of the colour of the cafe. There was no past or future. There were no names, places or dates. Then I had a vivid visual impression of Kyabje Dujam Rimshe. The vision lasted for an undefinable period of time. I'd not looked at my watch, so I had no idea whether time had passed or not. It could have been an hour, a minute or a second. Then I had no idea whether it was a vision or a daydream. It was not that I saw Kyabje Dujam Rimshe in the Nostril Café, he was simply there in space. It was not a flashback to the room where I used to speak with him in Boda. It was more as if the Nostral Café had vanished and Kyabje Dujam Rimshe was the only visual subject in existence. When the visual impression dissolved, 
the colours around me were more intense than they had been before. I was left feeling that Dudgeon Rinpoche knew what had taken place in the Nostril Café and was not displeased. Did I detect laughter? I decided that was wishful thinking. Then I decided it was pointless coming to any conclusion. To be hypercritical to the point of nihilism was as bad as indulging in eternalist fantasy. I simply felt cheered by the strong impression of Dudgeon Rinpoche that had called itself into existence. It felt natural and I felt cheered. Kyabje Dudgeon Rinpoche had said he would always be with me and he always was.